Okay, we're ready. Oh. Are we here? Are we on? <laughs> Alright. We get to take the chairs next time. Yeah. Hi everybody. It Hi. is great to see you all out there. And thank you so much for taking some time to uh, listen to Cindy and myself um, have a good conversation, I hope, about um, diversity and inclusion. But first, I've just had to go um, with her backstage about this OBE. You promised you wouldn't do this. <laughs> Ruby, you promised. I know, I know. But I, I needed to know, have you seen the Queen yet? No. And do you have your hat, Cindy? I um, haven't seen her yet. <laughs> And I do have my hat. That's the main thing. It's a baseball cap. I thought I'd wear it backwards uh, okay, and okay. That's ask her for a selfie. Fantastic. I think that's all right. I think that's good. Let's go with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, everybody, we're here to really talk about diversity and inclusion. And I think the first thing I'd love to hear from you, Cindy, is how is Microsoft thinking about diversity and inclusion in this space? It's a great question. And let me just welcome you all. Um, Thank you for spending time with us at Microsoft Ignite. It's amazing to see so many of you here today. So thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for a, a great question. I mean, look, at Microsoft, we have um, a super strong mission as a company, right? To empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And that mission puts D&I right at the core of who we are and what we do. And you could ask 110,000 of our employees anywhere in the world what our mission is and they would tell you word for word. And not only that, they would tell you what it means to them on a personal level, because for us it's very, very real. And um, you know, I think it's about defining diversity in the broadest possible sense. I think too many companies still define diversity in terms of the differences that they can see. So gender, ethnicity, age. Um, which is a great start, of course, it's important, but we also have to think about the differences that are less visible, right? Sexual orientation or socioeconomic diversity or neurodiversity. So we've just launched a program for um, <clears throat> hiring autistic people, which I'm super proud of because that's a whole area of diversity that I think is really underestimated. But I think the last thing to say about <clears throat> DNI is that, that the power of the end, it's diversity and inclusion, right? It's not enough to have diversity and no inclusion. Because if you have diversity and no inclusion, you just have lots of little cultural islands, yeah, right? Yeah. And you're kind of missing the point. Absolutely. And remember, we, <coughs> we sort of talked about that in that actually those little islands, um, as, when they're missed, they slow the mission down. Totally. Yeah. And, and so, and really need to be able to bring them together to really have the, the power. So that's great. So, I mean, being a, a Microsoft employee myself, and also seeing how um, the energy, um, the energy that we're putting into this is, is going, I really like you to try and break down what it, what you feel it means to the employee at Microsoft. Yeah, I mean, at Microsoft, the way we bring DNI to life for our employees is we tell everyone, come as you are do what you love, right? You've heard that from us a million times. Yeah. We live that every day. And I can honestly say, we put a DNI lens on everything we do. So whether it's internal or external communications, whether it's events like this, although I can see we may have to do better, uh, or whether it's even designing office space or making hiring decisions or making promotion decisions, like we put a DNI lens on absolutely every decision we make. And you know, it's important that um, the leadership really model inclusive behavior and do it in a really genuine and authentic way. Because I think we, we need to make it clear to our employees what we expect. And so that's super important. We've got ERGs. I think you're a member of an ERG, right? Yeah, yeah. An employee resource group. These are groups of employees that represent the diverse communities that live within Microsoft. I'm an ally of every yeah. ERG. Um, and I know that our Women at Microsoft ERG is now globally nearly 20,000 women. So big shout out to the Women at Microsoft who I'm sure are planning some great activities for the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day. Yeah, 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 they are. You're involved and in ERG. I, I, I am, I am. So I have been newly appointed the um, lead representing black, Asian, ethnic, minority uh, groups awesome. um, at Microsoft. 
Um, I, again, it was something that I wanted to do. I really felt that the energy and the work and the resource that we're putting in, I see we're, we're all responsible. And I think that's what the company have given us, this sense of responsibility that is up to each one of us to do our piece. So I'm really interested and, and happy to be um, taking on that role. Yeah, and I'm so glad you're doing that because yeah. it's it's hard enough to look bring women into tech, but then when you start to look at, you know, ethnic women, black women, Asian women, disabled women, the numbers dwindle pretty fast. Yes, they yes. say we need to do more yes. in that space. Yes. And then to that point, let's talk a little bit about how we are really looking um, at attracting women attracting and retaining women. For me, again, being a long time employee of Microsoft, the whole retention and, you know, what is the company doing to make me want to stay with the company? That's yeah. really important. But the attracting women, as we see out here, we need to get it done. It's critical. And what have you. So, so what, what, what are we doing now? Yeah, it's critical. And I think when you come to an event like this, which is primarily aimed at the technical population, yeah. you know, you can really see um, that it's a critical need for us to do more in this space and it's you know it's something close to my heart both as leader of microsoft but also as the mother of a 13 year old girl who i'm very much hoping decides to embark on a career in technology so it's it's a super important thing to me and you know we do a lot of things um, as a company for example i'll give you a couple of examples um, we're committed to supplier diversity uh, so last year, for example, we spent over $3 billion um, working with minority, disabled, veteran, and women-owned suppliers. So that's how we sort of scale our values through our ecosystem. Our Microsoft Venture Capital Fund, called M12, uh, for example, launched the Female Founders uh, Competition, which is a global competition, um, which accelerates access to, uh, to capital for female-owned startups and scale-ups. Um, we've got the Cloud Accelerator Lab, which is a six-month immersive program um, to assist women who are starting up businesses and trying to scale out their technical solutions. Um, and then finally, as you know, we've got probably dozens of educational programs to uh, attract more girls and young women into a career in tech. Um, my favorite is DigiGirls. Um, we have you know, girls year eight and nine, uh, which is, you know, the period of time when they're making decisions about what they want to do. Um, we have six times a year, we have them come to our headquarters. Um, we expose them to what a career in technology would be like. We run coding uh, workshops and um, they present to us. It's really amazing. Um, I go into schools every month and I talk to girls about careers in technology because they don't always feel it's relevant for yeah. them. Right, we, we have a marketing image problem in this industry, right? A lot of young girls think it's not for me, um, it's for middle-aged white men who are really good in science and math and it's not for me and it's not creative and it's not fulfilling. You and I know that nothing could be further from the truth, right? Yeah. So I really kind of make it my mission to try to <clears throat> change that misperception. We're touching 7,000 girls a year with this message of inspiration um, and relevance. So I'm hoping that we'll start to see that make a difference. But we already are. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's in the outing in Cardiff with you only last week, yeah. seeing how you were inspiring some girls in a school. We both went to a, a school in Cardiff and Cindy. Um, told her story, as did one of our most uh, uh, amazing yeah. Dr. Tempest. That's told right. her story as well. And so that whole the message of inspiration, I think coming from someone like you is very powerful. I think what's also powerful as well is that those examples that you have just given are touching so many areas of the ecosystem. Yeah. And this it is an ecosystem play. We can't just put all of our energies in one, one place. And I think Microsoft is doing a great job at that. One thing I did want to say, and especially when we're talking about inspiring the girls to go into tech and also to be leaders into tech, what are your thoughts about, you know, really holding that message to them as early as possible? So maybe even in the Digital Girls program, yeah. not talking about tech, but talking about leadership too, because we do need female leaders. I think it's a great suggestion, and I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take it back and think about how we can start to talk to girls about leadership as early as possible. The earlier the better. I mean, 
I have pretty strong views on um, the responsibility that women leaders have. Yeah. You know, I think my mother worked hard to break down barriers to make it easier for me. And I feel accountable to do the same for my daughter. And I think every female leader has a responsibility to make it easier for the next generation. So when I see female leaders kind of sitting on the fence, I get frustrated because I think we all have a responsibility. And of course, women can't change the world alone, right? We need help from our male colleagues yeah. to make change happen. So, yeah, that would be and, and to that point, I'm going to expose us. What are you on, saying now? On, on this, yeah, what now? What this time? On this stage, there are eight children. Cindy and I have eight children. We've given birth to a football team between the two of us. We have our own company here in Just My Children. scary. And out of the eight, <laughs> out of the eight children, we've got five boys yeah. and three girls yeah. between us, age ranging from early 20s to six. Wow. So we've got some work to do in terms of our accountability, our leadership, and also the messaging that we actually give to our families, right? Yeah, I think though, you know, uh, I probably like your children, my children have grown up with strong female role models. Um, in my That's case, true. they've grown up in a, a, a multi-racial household. My husband's Indian and a multi-religion um, household as well. So I think if you teach kids the importance of DNI young. I think they grow up to be adults who bring that behavior and that kind of sensitivity with them into the workplace and I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah definitely you know? and, and, and my story is my oldest is the girl who is interested in tech and the boys are seeing her having to maneuver through you know, sitting in a lecture room where there's six girls and there's a hundred and seventy boys. Yeah, it's tough. And they're seeing that now in 2019 as men and realizing actually, you know, they've got some work to do too. So yeah, Good yeah, <laughs> keep trying. <laughs> we'll keep trying. So let's talk about a few numbers. How do we feel that we're tracking really progress in terms of so Microsoft tracking is diversity goals. Yeah, it's, um, you know, globally, uh, I could bore you to tears with statistics, but I won't. You can go online and read our fourth annual comprehensive workforce demographic report, um, and you'll see that we are making progress on female representation, on ethnic representation. I think I'm personally more proud of the UK gender pay gap report that we put out last year, because all up across the UK subsidiary, Microsoft UK, we've got a six and a half percent gender pay gap, right? Not good enough. Of course it's not good enough, but it is um, by far leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of the tech industry, and I feel really, really proud of that. Um, our female representation in the UK is 34 and a half percent now, and in technical areas, it's over 18 percent. Um, so, you know, I really welcome uh, the government's requirement to publish these, this, this data, this gender pay gap data, because I think it shines a bright light on a really important issue. And, you know, I won't be happy until we close that gender pay gap, but um, we're not far off from doing that. So. Yeah, yeah. As we say, there's, there's work to be done, but I mean, I think the, the progress is something that we have to keep communicating. Totally. And I think it, the progress and the speed of it is what also motivates as well yes. to, to keep going. So why should other organizations even care about it? That's a great question. I mean, we assume, we assume they do, right? But I think in some cases, maybe that's not the case. So it's, it's always good, I think, to start with why should you care? Why should you care? There's so many good reasons to care. I think you only have to look at the macro trends in the world, um, for starters. Right? I mean, there's over a billion disabled people on the planet now. Um, global female purchasing power is now over $40 trillion. Um, by 2025, 75% of the workforce will be under 35 years old, our millennials, right? So our workforce obviously needs to evolve to reflect the macro trends in the world. Um, I think it's obvious, but, um, but the second thing, if, if that's not enough, 
is just the acute skills shortage that I think every business is struggling with. I mean, you know, technical skills are in huge demand. STEM skills, skills are in huge demand. Um, and I think that trend is likely to continue as this fourth industrial revolution, all the digital transformation that we're driving with our customers, those demands for skills. I mean, 35% of employers in the world are finding that they have a critical skills shortage, and the UK is no different. Uh, so really, to be competitive and to have the best qualified, skilled workforce, you have to start fishing in new ponds. You have to start bringing in new, diverse talent instead of fishing in the old ponds all the time. So I think that's critical to closing the skills gap. And then finally, I think DNI gives competitive advantage, and I think there are empiric there's empirical data to support that companies that are gender diverse, um, the study says, are 15% more likely to deliver financial returns above the national average. You know, companies that are ethnically diverse are 35% more likely to deliver financial returns above the national average. But more diverse organizations also have better employee engagement, um, better intention to, to stay to your retention point, um, have higher customer satisfaction and drive better innovation, decision making, customer outcomes. I mean, like, why wouldn't you care about this stuff is yeah. the question I would ask. Sure. And, I, and I think the idea, again, is to, to surface some of those amazing facts that you just said, because I, I don't actually know whether that message is really going to the people that need to hear that. So you know, thank you for sharing that. And, and also, in terms of the skills gap, the, the fact that uh, one of the um, activities that I know we're going to do with our International Women's Day um, piece is actually bringing in women and showing them um, what a data scientist could be, um, showing them um, how it works and actually encouraging them to actually do a data science course. And of course it's because we want this diverse um, set of data scientists, but the fact is we do not have enough data scientists to do anything. And so if we really need to move this agenda forward, um, these are kind of the bold moves that need to be done. And I'm, I'm so pleased that I know that we're doing them. Yes. <laughs> so um, I would love to talk about accessibility now. Great. Which, as you know, um, is part of DNI. And can you give me some examples of how um, Microsoft is really looking at accessibility? Yeah, I mean, accessibility is absolutely at the core for us. Um, it's, a, it's a key part of diversity and inclusion for us in every sense. I mean, I think 15% of the world's population are considered disabled. And there's some incredible talent in that community um, that, you know, mustn't be underestimated or excluded from job opportunities. And I think, you know, I really am proud of what Microsoft does uh, to to really bring our products and services to life for people with disabilities. A couple of great examples, I think. Uh, Windows 10 eye gaze, yeah. right? Native to Windows 10 is the ability to control the user interface with your eyes. And if you've ever seen this done in real life, it's incredibly inspiring. Um, we have a, a developer here in the UK named Sakib Sheikh, who's developed an amazing application called Seeing AI, which uses AI basically to narrate the world for those uh, with visual impairments. And I think that's an, a real game changer. Um, I demo that app probably at once a day for people, and they're always blown away. It's available for free, and everyone's got someone in their life who can really be helped by this kind of technology. And you know, another thing I'm incredibly proud of, I don't know if any of you saw the ad during the Super Bowl for the new Xbox adaptive controller, you know, tagline, when we all, when everybody can play, we all win. Yes. And it's a, it's an adaptive controller um, for gamers who have physical disabilities. And that product was the outcome of an employee hackathon, uh, which I just think, you know, good on Microsoft for doing stuff like that. I think it's, it's brilliant. I'm yeah. just super proud of that. Yeah. And and I, and I think that, that the whole notion of, of bringing that 15% on is just amazing, and powerful. And then there's also the, the extension of that too, which is actually the solutions that we come out with 
can actually benefit those who are also do not have the disabilities as well, but have an easier way to work, have a, a, have a more a, a more um, a solutions that they are looking for in their day to day lives anyway in terms of productivity and. Um, some of these solutions, I work in the emerging markets as you know, and one of the issues is the digital skills as well and digital literacy. Now actually if we can use some of the solutions that we've looked at for accessibility and transfer that over to, um, the, to digital literacy, we're just impacting so many more people. So I think, I think it, it's so far reaching what we're doing at the moment. So it's enriched all of us? Yes, it yeah. really has. It really has. It's great. So, in terms of, I'm going to go back to inclusion because I do feel sometimes it gets lost Yes. Um, in the whole conversation about diversity, about accessibility and what have you. And really that inclusion piece is, is something that it feels like it's a thread that needs to flow through everything that we're doing. Yeah. What, what do you and it's really super hard inclusion, right? It's super hard because diverse representation based on differences that you can see can be easily measured, right? companies love to measure stuff. It's very hard to measure inclusive behavior and, and it's hard to know when you're succeeding. So, you know, if it's hard, sometimes people think about it a little bit less. But um, at Microsoft, we are really focused on inclusion. In fact, um, every senior executive at Microsoft has their compensation tied to inclusivity goals, myself included. And in fact, everyone at Microsoft has an inclusivity goal um, within their business objectives. So when you get to your performance review, you know, you'll have to talk to your manager about what you've done to drive inclusivity uh, within the company. Um, and we have a saying at Microsoft that is, I go where I'm invited, I stay where I'm welcome. Yeah. And inclusiveness, I think, is about feeling welcome and valued and respected where your contribution means something. Yeah. Um, I read a recent report from Deloitte and it said 80% of employees said inclusion was an important factor in choosing an employer. And 72% would leave the organization for a more inclusive one. So I think, you know, against, in the context of those kinds of statistics, I think the inclusion part of DNI becomes kind of existential if you're running a business, right? This is not optional anymore. This is existential, you know, business imperative. So, you know, it's very hard. It's very hard. It's, um, I think of inclusive behavior as something that's very personal to all of us. It's about small micro behaviors um, and about talking about it openly, giving each other feedback, keeping each other honest, and committing to continuous improvement because none of us are perfect. And as much as I think about it, I still find myself sometimes doing things that are not inclusive. Yeah. And I rely on people around me to say, hey, let me give you some feedback, and I love that. Yeah, and and I and I think these, that that whole notion of it, there are these, these small, s subtle things that can happen to make you not feel included. Yeah. And you know, as a, as a black woman in tech, you know, I, I have stories and then experiences. And, and one of the things to add to that is actually the ability for um, corporations to give their employees courage to be able to speak up and a safe place and a safe environment to talk about their challenges. And I know that our ERGs are our places for that. And I know management is supposed to be a place for that too as well. And it's definitely something that I know that we're working on in terms of uh, Microsoft's approach to it. Yeah, our approach to inclusivity um, has evolved and continues yeah. to evolve. So we have um, an inclusive behavior framework 10 inclusive behavior framework. Uh, we put all of our employees through mandatory unconscious bias training. Um, and you know, these behaviors, um, I find myself using them at home sometimes as well, because they're just yeah. common sense behaviors. Yeah. You know? What I do is, every time my leadership team meets, we'll choose a behavior and we'll practice it. Uh, and we'll discuss it and talk about you know, how it felt. So, for example, um, I'm, looking, I'm looking at it now, but it could be about making sure all voices are heard, yeah. right? Every team has extroverts and introverts, and you know, sometimes it's just about asking the introverts in the room, what's on your mind, what do you think of this, and inviting them into the conversation. Uh, sometimes people need a bit of encouragement, or having a reaction to someone or something that was said, and 
reflecting on why you're having that reaction and unpicking the unconscious bias that you're experiencing. And I'm just practicing this, these behaviors, I think is the path to um, creating an environment that feels safe. As you yeah, say. I think so. Yeah. And, and I think that whole idea of, of tagging that um, to, again, our, our compensation, our connects, and making sure that the company from top to bottom yeah. is tracking to that as well. Because that can sometimes be an issue as well when not everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. And we've already recognized that in, in some of the work that we've been doing. Absolutely. That's it. Well, thank you, Boomi. You're and, uh, welcome. Thanks, everyone, for hanging in there. <laughs>